Our next speaker, Jason Mello, uh, spoke at the Microservices Day in London, uh, and that's the first time I met him face to face. Although we, ADP is a customer of ours, and so I knew I knew about ADP. Um, he, he's going to talk about. Uh, the journey that ADP has gone through, and, and ADP is at the very forefront of microservices, which is unusual for an organization as large as ADP. And he's going to talk about something that's, that's very close to my heart, which is about organizational change. How do you change an organization so that it can successfully adopt new approaches and new technologies? And I think that's a challenge that all of us face as we move to these more radical approaches, when you sit down in front of your boss and say, we're going to ship a new release every 15 minutes, and he freaks out because he's used to shipping a new release every six months. And I think some of the things that Jason will talk about may help you to articulate that value proposition and to make those transformations in your organizations. Jason, come on stage here. If you could stay down on the bottom of the podium, because sure, sure. otherwise I just down, look, yeah, I just look like a midget. <laughs> thanks, Jason. Hopefully the camera cuts, covers the top of my head. Uh, thanks, guys. Um, you know, thanks for uh, for the time. Appreciate uh, the being here. Uh, yeah, I'm with uh, ADP, but really specifically uh, Lithion, which is uh, you know essentially kind of like a, a startup, a spinoff uh, that uh, we kind of uh, uh, ideated on and uh, and incubated and uh, created. Uh, really with the uh, kind of the mission of, you know, disintermediating, uh, disrupting ADP from, from the inside out. Uh, someone's going to do it, uh, so we figured we, we should be the folks that are going to do it with the most insider knowledge in terms of being successful at that. Uh, all of kind of my uh, relevant information is available there if you guys want to reach out or find out a little bit more. Um, and our engineering blog, even though it's a little bit kind of uh, nascent at this point, we have uh, some content on there. If you guys want to dive deeper into our journey and some of the specifics of that, uh, there's, uh, there's starting to be some great content on there. So uh, welcome you all to check that out. Uh, great. So what are, what are kind of my goals uh, for the talk today? Um, one, I want to introduce you guys uh, briefly to Lithion, uh, dive into a little bit more of our mission there and what it is that we're going on. Um, why microservices uh, for us, right? Why do we make this investment uh, from kind of, as, as Joe mentioned, right, top to bottom, organization, leadership, all the way down to uh, the actual, um, you know, code that we're developing there. Um, technology is not everything. Uh, certainly touch on a lot of aspects of our technology journey, but that's one component uh, in terms of when we look at microservices and microservices as a pattern, not necessarily as a, you know, a Docker container that you uh, spin up and run in, uh, in production. Um, and uh, kind of a, a journey in five parts, uh, how we scaled, right? Some of the challenges that we uh, encountered, uh, some of the, the friction uh, that was involved there and how we were able to, uh, to deal with that friction moving forward. Okay, um, you know, and in order to scale, you really have to invest in, in what I'll call kind of mundane rigor, uh, the things that are not always kind of, uh, you know, the new and exciting and, uh, and uh, you know, where developers are, uh, you know, kind of doing backflips every day, um, but the, the dividends that that pays and that investment is, are, uh, are profound. Cool. So yeah, so Lithion uh, by ADP, right? So ADP itself, um, uh, how many of you guys have been paid by ADP at some point in your career, right? Your paycheck had ADP on it. Yeah, roughly about the sampling. We, we, we ran the numbers uh, a couple years back and basically landed on uh, roughly about an 89% probability uh, that if you are a professional in the United States, uh, that you've been on an ADP payroll at some point in your career or that you will be. Uh, and that number is starting to grow globally as well. Uh, we have about 600,000 clients uh, worldwide, uh, a lot of those on what we call our, our SaaS uh, products, uh, and we're the largest payroll and HR provider uh, in the world. Uh, and we're over 60 years old, so of course the kind of company you think about when you think about microservices, right? <laughs> Uh, so, you know, a little bit more about what is Lithion and what are we building. Uh, like I said, we're a startup. Uh, we're all ADP employees, but we're focused on a very kind of specific mission, a product and technology driven mission, uh, and something where we can kind of, you know, extract ourselves from, from the mothership, but still uh, be aligned with them uh, and, and really kind of driving uh, the future platform. And I'll go into more details about that in a little bit. 
Um, we're located here in, in, uh, in New York City uh, for our headquarters in, uh, in Chelsea. Uh, really proud of, uh, of our location and of our team there. Uh, and we're spread across the globe, you know, Lithion itself. We have uh, major development uh, centers in Hyderabad uh, in India, as well as Chennai. Uh, and then folks kind of sprinkled uh, throughout the uh, world. And uh, lucky enough to also work with Nearform on some of our projects. Cool. So, um, you know, as I mentioned, kind of we're here to, um, you know, disrupt ADP, disrupt the mothership. And what that means for us is how we go about building what I call our asynchronous enterprise um, from top to bottom. And that really starts with what we call the HR operating system, uh, which is the product that we're building. Um, and what that is focused on, it's got a few kind of core tenants uh, in terms of our mission. One being domain agnostic. Uh, so similar to like how you'll see, you know, the sales forces of the world, the force.coms of the world. Uh, yeah, they were born out of the CRM industry, um, but really you can build a lot of line of business applications on top of it. Uh, and a very kind of similar model in terms of what we're doing. Almost think about it as like iOS um, in the uh, mobile world. Global first. Uh, so global first is uh, one of the most important things for us you know time and time again companies will try to you know go after different markets go after different uh, product segmentation or different uh, customizations for clients our approach is to say, look, we're going to adopt an inheritance model, a composition model, uh, to be able to extend applications out to the different markets that we're looking to serve, um, not to invest heavily in you know, rebuilds and reapplications and uh, different things and kind of chasing different markets, um, but really allowing us to have a lot of velocity in terms of the, the line of business applications um, that we can deliver into the industry. Um, so I don't know if you guys are familiar with kind of uh, uh, a term that's starting to be coined in terms of these types of rapid application development environments, but the, the low code uh, dev experience. So really kind of looking at a full stack experience from uh, data definitions all the way up to the UI and whether that's web or mobile, uh, allowing you know, business analysts, uh, product owner type users, people who are connected to the business to ship products uh, to, to their customers, to their users. Um, great. And, you know, we're, we're cloud native. Uh, that's really important for us, which is also something very different than we see in large enterprises such as our, our home, right? Uh, everything we do is 100% on AWS. Every service that we run uh, is within containers. Um, and, you know, adopting kind of the, the cloud tenants, not just about, hey, I have some EC2 resources uh, that I can take advantage of, but also a real kind of, um, you know, adherence to the ephemerality of services and compute as a commodity. Uh, so that's kind of the, the basic uh, tenants of how we architect our things. Some of the highlights from a technology perspective and some of our stack here, uh, Docker throughout, Docker all the things. Uh, Kafka is a really big uh, piece for us in terms of, uh, you know, kind of getting into the te theme of the asynchronous enterprise uh, so that we can build decoupled event-driven services and event-driven patterns. Um, and that really kind of speaks also throughout the stack, whether it's uh, the application code that we're writing, you know, looking at projects like ReactiveJS, uh, Akka in the Scala world, uh, all the way up to the actual services and how they interoperate. A uh, number of different databases, I only just highlighted a couple of there, but really if there's a kind of a different, uh, you know, data schema, data model out there, uh, we probably support it uh, in terms of relational, columnar, uh, and through and through. Uh, Jenkins, you know, Node.js, kind of those are the major building blocks. What I wanted to highlight here is roughly about 160 uh, plus services uh, kind of growing every day. Uh, if we look at kind of individual Docker images uh, that are being run. Sorry, guys, I don't hear that. Um, if we look at production at any one given point in time based on kind of how we're scaled, we have about 4,000 uh, containers that we run in production uh, at any given instance, spread across about 700 or so uh, EC2 hosts. Um, and, you know, from a Kafka perspective, again, depending on kind of the, uh, the activity of the day or what's going on, about 45,000 messages that we see flowing through there per second uh, across logging, across uh, business level events, uh, alerts, all the different things. We, we pipe it through Kafka so that we have that, uh, you know, normalized pipeline uh, to be able to ingest messages uh, through. Okay. It's not changing. All right, so, all right, great. Um, cool, so 
Let me just see here. Sorry, guys. First time I'm giving uh, this talk. So why, why the move away from the monolith, right? We all started, when we started developing this, we were you know, a handful of folks uh, thinking about what it is, what was this future platform going to be, and how we were going to build it. And we didn't start with microservices from day one, right? We started building a platform, uh, a rather monolithic one. Uh, and, and really, it was less about the technology at the time uh, for us, and more about the organization that we wanted to build. We wanted to be able to have autonomous teams uh, that could make their own technology selection. They could drive their own agendas forward. We could ship code uh, to our customers uh, much more rapidly. And as, um, as Paul was touching on earlier, reducing the footprint, reducing the probability um, for failure in terms of uh, the services and the features that we were pushing out there. Um, we also wanted to avoid kind of, uh, you know, called the, the high bus factor uh, for the folks that kind of know the entirety of the system uh, and these real wizards in your organization. How can we compartmentalize that? How can we create more discrete services and allow for a much larger kind of organizational federation of, of development to occur? Okay. Uh, reducing technology change friction. Uh, I don't know how many of you guys are in kind of the Node.js world and how many version uh, upgrades we've seen lately going all the way from 0.12 to 4 to 5 to 6, all the different language variants uh, there in between. Uh, some teams want to use uh, TypeScript. Some teams, for whatever reason, want to use CoffeeScript. Um, and, you know, it allows for that autonomy. It allows for folks to kind of make their own decisions. Uh, but I'll get into a little bit later on in terms of where that can kind of start to fall down and where you need to invest. And I think it uh, speaks to a lot of what uh, Yunang was uh, speaking about from Netflix in terms of standardizing and creating these, you know, kind of turnkey as a service uh, type, of, uh, type of solutions. Um, you know, so we've, we've been at this for about well over a year uh, and we're still learning every day. Um, you know, no one has uh, kind of solved the microservices equation, uh, so I think it's really important to keep that in mind and, and see this as a journey and not just a, uh, something you can flip the switch on uh, and be off and running. So for us, uh, kind of the key point here for me is governance and process uh, fosters velocity and innovation at scale. Uh, and I want to run through about kind of five different parts or five different themes uh, in terms of uh, that journey and, and where we found a lot of... Um, uh, a lot of kind of um, you know opportunities to to change what it is that we're doing, but before I get into that, right? Um, there's you know the technology implications and the burden of running microservices are profound, right? It is very different from running a single monolithic application. There are so many considerations that you have to take into account, um, not only from a technology perspective, you know, looking at things like uh, distributed logging, centralized logging solutions. Uh, how do we handle um, you know, simple things like deployment. How do we make sure that we can keep our services up and running and that a single service doesn't take down the entire, um, the entire stack, okay? Um, you know, you need to really kind of adopt a spirit of expecting failure. And we learned, it's one thing to say that, it's another thing to ensure that, you know, your, your technology leaders, um, the folks that are on your team, your tech leads, they are really kind of drinking that punch. They are guiding their teams down the path of saying, look, this will fail. My dependencies will not be available. Uh, my dependencies may go down while I'm running. Um, and I really cannot rely on anything. So how do you code for that? It's a, it's a very kind of a, it's a fundamental mind shift um, from where we've seen development patterns uh, thus far, right? And, you know, your engineers, they, they don't think in these ways. And so it's extremely important to just kind of keep that conversation going. Uh, look at this as one of the tenets that you review in your code reviews. Um, and, and really strive for this in terms of challenging and asking why. Okay, why does your, why does your service init in this way? Um, why does it check its dependencies with this particular pattern? And it may be something good that you can then apply across the organization. Um, so, you know, self-healing and resiliency needs to exist at the code level. Uh, a lot of folks, you know, they get really excited about, um, you know, microservices. They get excited about Docker and containers. And, you know, we saw this. We went through it. 
um, you know, your orchestration layer, your container orchestration, whether you're leveraging Swarm or Mesos or, or frameworks like that, and your schedulers, they will not solve this problem entirely for you. Um, there are uh, implications at the code level that you need to adopt and you need to uh, put into place. Uh, whether that's a circuit breaker pattern, uh, whatever kind of retry logic that you need to have in place, um, you know, just because you put your code in a container and ran it through a pipeline to be then scheduled onto a, uh, a host doesn't mean that it will respond appropriately in all the different scenarios that you'll encounter during runtime. Okay. Uh, caring about the sequence of dependencies uh, is, is really kind of a fallacy, right? Um, we, we ran into this where, well, you know, service A has to be up before service B and service C can come up after that. So let's build this complexity into our orchestration and into our schedulers. Let's uh, make sure that we can define the order of dependencies and the sequence of dependencies. We, we found that to be a, a big kind of area of brittleness and friction within the system. Services should have, as I mentioned before, no notion of, hey, is my dependency up or not? Uh, and let's just kind of uh, wait until that happens for services to come into existence. Okay. And we were also kind of looking at, um, you know, and, and suffering from the, the kind of the, um, the plague of many different snowflakes, right? Uh, team A, hey, we've got this great way that we're going to uh, do dependency um, uh, management, and uh, this really works for us. And Team B says, you know what, guys, that doesn't work for us. We're going to go and, and do it this other way. Um, and that's all well and good. You want to foster that autonomy, but at the end of the day, you need to bring governance into place, um, and you need to be able to standardize that. Otherwise, you're going to struggle around, hey, how do I um, bootstrap a new service? How do I bring that into existence? How do I onboard new developers into the organization and they have common patterns that they can follow uh, and we can really grow and scale the organization. Okay. And uh, you know, one, one, um, one quote that I just wanted to touch on, I read it recently, is that big problems are best solved by breaking them up into many smaller ones that are, sorry, that are easier to, uh, to handle. The basic engineering idea is what leads teams to start decomposing large monoliths into smaller services and eventually into microservices. The ultimate goal is to go back to being creative uh, and successfully uh, enabling the team to develop useful products and quick, as quickly as possible. Right? It speaks to um, um, what, what Yunnan from Netflix was uh, talking about in terms of focus on the business logic. Right? Bring in those practices, the governance practices, to focus on the business logic. If, uh, you know, say for instance, you needed to you know, build a large monolithic job application, um, you, know, you wouldn't be concerned with, hey, every single time, how do I do routing? How do I do my service in it? How do I bring all these services up? It's solved. It's solved once. And bringing that pattern and, and uh, extending that across all of your microservices uh, is critical. Okay. So let's go into it. Microservices are a pattern, as I mentioned, uh, not a particular um, you know, technology. So for us, um, this kind of goes beyond containers, Docker, right? We do all those things. Um, but it's also about how you organize your code. Um, on our development environment, what we call our toolkits, we adhere, uh, we implement basically uh, a code organization in our repositories that allows other teams to plug in their development workflows, their development toolkits into the mix. It's not exposed as services per se, um, but the way that you organize your code and allowing teams to have that separation of logic but then plug into the whole um, is one way that we're able to pull that off without having you know, 100 different services just to build one developer experience. API contracts, um, these are kind of the lifeblood of an organization um, developing on microservices. It's your promise to others, right? So version contracts, uh, documented contracts, uh, things which are published and available for all the other teams to consume. Uh, this is this is critical. Um, you know, I, I'm uh, always kind of surprised and and uh, pleasantly surprised when I come across groups that say, "Hey, I've built out these new services, these new capabilities for the organization, um, and I didn't have to, you know, have a bunch of meetings with a bunch of teams to figure out how to do that and how to extend uh, our ecosystem. I was just able to pull down a Git repo, go to our Confluence docs, and look at the definition of." Our API contracts, um, able to read through the readmes in detail. So that's also part of kind of in our in our culture what we bring into the code review process. 
how are the run books defined, how are the readmes defined, and where are your contracts published. It's almost more important uh, than the code that you're developing. And another big aspect for us, which is really important, is putting the build pipeline in the hands of the teams. Uh, we try to not be prescriptive and say, your service goes through these three different stages and then deploys that out to production. Uh, teams can uh, you know, customize that pipeline to their needs, um, which is really, really powerful, especially when you look at uh, different services will have different security implications, um, different types of code scanning that has to go on. Uh, our mobile teams have very different um, you know, build processes with integrating with Sauce Labs and other kinds of testing frameworks like that. Um, and that's, that's really critical that they have the power in their hands to do that. Okay. So another pattern that we see, uh, kind of number two here, is cross-functional and cross-vertical teams. Um, very similar to the SRE model, we don't quite call it that, but um, we've broken things down to say, look, we have a separate data engineering team, right? And they really kind of focus on how do we bring turnkey functional APIs uh, to our uh, platform engineers so that they can plug into a cluster and start developing their services. They can't be concerned with how do we arrive at Quorum with Cassandra? Um, how do we you know, set up uh, Kafka and Zookeeper and all of those things? But rather they can take um, a particular the client, whether it's a Node or Java or whatnot, drop it into their service, have a functional API available to them, and be off and running. Um, and those teams will then, you know, engage and embed with the uh, the full stack teams, with the with the service teams um, that are building their offerings, so that we can ensure that what we're doing can actually ship to production. Um, a lot of times we got into this place where we said, look, this is great, we're code complete, we've got this awesome feature, but it keeps falling down. It's not ready for prime time and we can't bring it to production. And we ran into a lot of issues in terms of that handoff process. Um, so the embedding, the engagement uh, was critical for us, for us to be able to, uh, to scale that out. So messaging, messaging is probably um, one of the, uh, the biggest components for us, as I was mentioning our Kafka cluster before. Uh, Kafka is king, right? So everything goes through there, whether it's um, different uh, events that emit from our main system of record database, um, you know, MySQL in this situation. So all the data points that are touched, all the deltas of information of change flow through Kafka so that um, any different consumer that cares about that can build systems based on that pattern. Uh, logging, all of our logging goes through Kafka so we can see uh, and run stream analysis on that alerting, um, it's, it's one of the linchpins of the system. Uh, and then on different consumers, you have an easy pluggability to support things like you know, your Spark cluster, uh, Cassandra, where you may want to do some different slicing and dicing of, of your data, uh, or different application services, because we also will kind of um, re-emit events after enriching them to bring business context to those events. And then at the application level, you know, the, say the you know, compensation app might care about the fact that you just gave someone a promotion. Uh, the system itself, the platform, has no knowledge of that um, or, or doesn't understand uh, the context of that, but your applications do, and the folks that are building the line of business, they should have the same patterns extended out to them uh, as you have on the platform side. So investing in that ad adoption is key, right? Um, you know, if, if you guys, I don't know how many of you guys work with uh, Kafka, today, but it's really kind of focused in the JVM space. There's not a whole lot of great support when you look at, you know, Node.js or other runtimes. They're, they're frankly a little bit flaky. So, um, you know, we've had to do a lot of kind of wrapping of those client libraries, again, creating functional APIs and allowing uh, folks to drop in a library, be off and running, and not really kind of care about the implementation details beyond that. So logging and tracing, uh, number four on the list for us. Um, you, know, you know, Elk uh, is, is not free. Elk for us is Elasticsearch, Logstash, and Kibana. Um, there was a big, big effort, a big investment in terms of getting this right. Um, but the investment pays dividends once you are able to, to do that. So um, it's not something where, hey, I can take a couple of open source components, probably just three of them, because the acronym only lists out three things. Uh, and it's super simple. Uh, it's much, much more complex than that. End-to-end um, -end tracing is one of our lifeblood. So uh, consistent implementation of request headers so that 
if you have a trace, if you have a transaction, you can see that transaction throughout all of your different services. Um, we've evolved it quite a bit, but one of the great starting points for us was a uh, open source project called Zipkin. Uh, highly recommend Zipkin uh, to folks. You can basically drop it in, uh, implement their client libraries. They have ones for a lot of different runtimes and start to visualize all of the different um, interactions and all the different um, kind of the flow of data throughout your, your microservices. Um, and when we kind of evolved that even a little bit further, we said, look, uh, business users can, um, uh, can benefit from this, right? They're not completely kind of abstracted from, hey, there's, we have our data service, we have our UI engine. Where in the process uh, is my, my um, basically my customer experience slowing down or improving based on a release, a feature release that may have been pushed out there? This is a little example uh, from one of our data dog metrics that we uh, grab up. So we, we do this thing where we can load you know, org charts, massive org charts for all different types of uh, organizations. And this really illustrates the different layers in the full life cycle of being able to support that process. So we can see, OK, if I go in and I want to say, you know, get my manager by an organization, I can look at all the different services and where the latency in the system is happening. Uh, one of the biggest advantages for us here is around correlation, and especially correlation to deployment events. When we deployed a, you know, a new version of a service, we either saw an increase or a degradation in performance, and we're able to pinpoint that, and we're able to see it uh, visualized quite nicely there. Cool. Okay, so the last of the five for us, um, and it's kind of like the theme throughout, is service templates and turnkey governance. Um, you know, driving templates and governed adoption patterns, uh, everyone adheres to the same levels of play. Uh, so how do you create a data as a service layer? How do you create messaging as a service? Uh, how do you create our developer toolkits as a service, as I was mentioning? Uh, allowing folks to really plug into that ecosystem and be off and running uh, is key, and that's where you really kind of get that organizational velocity and that, that ability to ship features much more rapidly because the hit when you adopt microservices is, is profound. Um, your development cycles will decrease. You'll be dealing with um, you know, de developers on your team just generally not being happy because the system that you've implemented is so complex. Um, so these kind of turnkey services, uh, super, super important. And wrapping your core business service in common libraries is also key. So you can make sure that, hey, every service that we bring into existence implements the transaction tracer. Every service that we implement does logging in the same way. Um, just pulling all of that away from your developers uh, is key to getting that, that velocity going. And as I mentioned, kind of the uh, X is a service pattern, um, which brings out you know, single click uh, commands. Um, you know, for us, we've developed this tool that we call Broccoli. Um, we used to have a tool at the last microservices day, I spoke about a tool called Taylor. Uh, we've evolved that, now we call it Broccoli. Uh, it's basically a single line command that wraps, wraps up all of our Docker Compose. Uh, all of our ability to say, I want to run portions of the platform or the entire platform locally on development. Uh, or I want to run that in my cloud instance because, you know what, I really want to bring my own data sets in, in, into, uh, into existence and not have to, um, you know, run against my test servers and my integration environment. I, I need some more isolation. So developers can really kind of um, drive and slice and dice how they want their development experience to happen. Cool. Um, so that's it in terms of the kind of the five different core areas and what was really kind of, you know, it, it seems kind of trivial as, I, as I'm saying it, but kind of profound lessons that, that we learned in going through this. Um, and, and one of the big things from an organizational perspective and a communication perspective, it was really important for us to fully live in public. Um, and what that means is, you know, how we communicate things out to other teams within the organization, uh, how we uh, are able to communicate out to, out to ADP, out to, our, um, out to the mothership, as it were. Everything that we do is, is published and made available for everyone in the organization. Uh, and there's no kind of you know, semblance of, OK, well, you have these kind of silos of operation, and they're basically black boxes. We don't know what's going on. Uh, everything is, is done very much in public. So it's one of our, one of our kind of core tenants. Cool. So, you know, as uh, we'd love to have you guys uh, check us out. Who was hiring? Uh, if you have any questions, uh, come talk to me, um, or or you can reach out on our career site. Uh, you know, um, sorry, one sec. Uh, and 
yeah, that's that's about it. So thank you, thank you for your time, uh, and uh, appreciate it. Thanks so much, Jason. It was great. So, uh, first of all, this is a real organization building real microservices to solve real world problems. I, I think the most interesting lesson I took from Jason's talk is, you know, centralized compliance is going to be an important goal for any large scale organization that wants to adopt these approaches across a, in a distributed organization. So I, I know lots of developers that I work with see microservices as a way to go off into the wild and do whatever the hell they want. But if you want your microservices to cooperate and, and participate in a larger microservice ecosystem, then some level of process orientation and coordination is going to be super important.